Okay. I'm a movie star now. <laughs> okay, um, again, I hope that the microphone picks up uh, my voice here. But uh, in any case, last time we talked about gases in general. The properties that we can measure in the lab, like volume, pressure, temperature, and then we establish that these behaviors, these properties, all are linked by a set of laws that can all be kind of like blended into what's called the ideal gas equation. And we saw the use for the ideal gas equation, for example, in uh, predicting the density of a gas if we know its formula, or calculating the molar mass of a gas if we can establish its density uh, you know, experimentally. And we can also use it to solve stoichiometry problems with reactions that involve gases. Again, what we do in chemistry, remember what I said the first day, is you, you experience, you observe things in the macro world, and then you go to the atomic and molecular world and you explain them over there. So today we're going to propose a theory to explain why is it that gases behave according to these very uniform laws of behavior. And it's called the kinetic molecular theory of gases. I'm going to go through the you know, postulates of this theory. Then I'm going to do a little derivation for you guys just in case you like math and stuff like that. And if you don't, well, just you know, take a little... you know pause in your brain for a moment there, all right? So the first thing that the uh, theory says is that a gas is composed of molecules that are separated from each other by distances far greater than their own dimensions. Uh, in other words, gas molecules or atoms, in the case of the noble gases, behave as if they were points of mass. With mass, in other words, but their actual molecular volume is negligible. And therefore, at that level, the distance between particles is enormous with respect to the size of the particles themselves, okay? The second point we're going to say is that gas molecules are in constant motion and in all directions. This is an entirely random process. And because of that, molecules will collide frequently with one another. However, when they collide, there is no net gain or loss of energy. They collide, they collide, I'm sorry, they bounce off each other. And, you know, unlike when, let's say, I throw a ball again, a basketball on the floor, and it doesn't come back up to the original height I dropped it from because it loses energy, Particles will bounce off each other or off the walls of the container, and they're not going to lose any energy in the process. We call that an elastic collision. All right? Number three, gases, uh, the molecules of gases do not exhibit any kind of attractive or repulsive forces uh, on one another. So we studied before about ions and how you know, positive and negative attract each other, or same charges repel each other. We've mentioned in lab about water, how water molecules have a force of attraction for each other, which is what holds them uh, on, from dropping from a container uh, by the force of gravity until they form a drop that's big enough to be basically collapse, right? Gas molecules have no forces of attraction or interaction with each other of any kind. And last but not least, because these are in constant motion, as we learned on day one, that means they have kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of a sample is always related to the temperature, because temperature is kind of the way that we index uh, the amount of kinetic energy in there. But the point here is that if a gas follows this kinetic molecular theory, in other words, if we're talking about an ideal gas, what's going to happen is the kinetic energy of its particles depends only on the temperature. It doesn't depend on the identity of the gas. In other words, 
two gases, let's say carbon dioxide and nitrogen, even though they are different, at a given temperature, the molecules of the sample have the same average kinetic energy, all right? And we're going to see how that plays into something we're going to learn later on about the way that gas molecules propagate in space, okay? So let's, uh, I'm going to do a little uh, derivation here. I'm going to move over here to our uh, canvas, I'm sorry, to our doc cam. Okay, so I'm going to, for those of you watching the recorded thing, I'm going to step out of the screen for a moment here. <laughs> Switch over here. I'm going to get a pen. Okay. So let's do this. So let's start out by considering a particle of a gas. Right, so consider, oops, that's not good. where are we, I don't know what this is, oh, you know what, I remember, I zoomed out of here, all right, again, let's consider a gas particle, and let's say that it is moving, at constant velocity, I'm going to abbreviate that as V, and we're going to track the movement for a time from T equals zero to a final time equal T, right? So if I plot this uh, movement of this particle on a graph, and here is time, and here is the velocity. Remember, we started at time equals zero and a velocity v, and we're going to go all the way to time equal t. So that means that the particle is going through this motion here until it arrives at this point. So it started out at a point zero V and ended up at point T V. Remember the X, Y coordinate system? Now, since the velocity is defined as the distance travel in a unit of time, right? right? Velocity equals D over A time period, if I were to ask what distance did the particle travel, if I had measured its starting point and its final point, what would have been the distance traveled? Well, based on this equation here, we can see that the distance would be V times the time, right? This from the equation there, just rearranging the equation, right? But notice that V times T is actually the area under that line. In other words, it's this here. See that? So in a plot of velocity versus time, the distance is essentially the area under that line, all right? So let's take a second scenario. Consider, again, a gas particle. But this time, we're going to change the scenario. This time, we are going to go move from an initial velocity, which is zero, in other words, from being motionless, to a final velocity, which will be V, so our target velocity. But we're going to say it's going to be at constant acceleration.
Remember, acceleration is essentially A, which is the change in velocity over a particular time. What we're saying is that over a period of time, the acceleration changes at the same rate. And then we're going to, again, go from time t equals 0 to t final equals t. So we're going to just track it from an initial point in time to a set target time point, and we're going to track the velocity change over that time period. So again, we're going to draw the graph here. Here's the velocity. Here is the time. We start at time zero. We're going to go to time t. But here's the difference. In this case, the velocity is increasing. So we start out at zero velocity, and we're going to change all the way until we get to velocity v. All right? Notice again, the acceleration is the change in velocity over time. But that would be final minus initial divided by final minus initial. But remember, we started at zero time, zero velocity. In other words, the particle was not moving. So these get canceled out, which means that the acceleration essentially is V <coughs> over T. Okay, let's do this now. Energy is defined as a force acting over a mass through a, to move it through a certain distance. So kinetic energy is essentially work performed in taking a mass from a certain point to another point. So if you remember, if you took physics already, you know this is force times distance. So let's see what these are. Force is calculated as mass times the acceleration. And distance, of course, is in there. So we have the mass, but the acceleration we said is V over T, right? And we said that the distance in a velocity versus time graph is the area under the line. Well, in this case, the area under the line is actually a triangle. So the area would be one half of the velocity times the time. So over here we have velocity times time, but here is half, you know, one dimension, one side versus the other one. As you can see, when we do this, the time variables cancel out, and so we are left with saying that the kinetic energy equals one half m v squared. That is one of the expressions uh, you can derive for the kinetic energy of a moving party. It's essentially what it means is the work performed in moving a mass from resting state to a particular velocity v. That's what it means. Okay? So this is the work 
done in moving particle of mass m from resting state to b speed or velocity now here's the problem <clears throat> That sounds great for a single particle, but as you know already, we never measure things for a single molecule or single particle. We measure a whole zillion of them, right, in any sample. So what we have to do then is, instead of using the velocity of a single particle, we need like an average. But we cannot really calculate an average because that would mean measuring the speed of every single molecule and then dividing by you know whatever gazillion number of items we have so what scientists do is they use a statistical approach and instead of measuring the actual you know mathematical average you mention what's called a statistical average so what we're going to do is instead of v squared we use u squared with a bar on top and that is called the mean square speed again it's a u squared but with a bar on top of the u indicating that this is not a mathematical average it's a statistical average and in a few moments, I'll show you an experiment that is done to find what that value is for the uh, sample of gas in question, okay? So, trust me, what I've done here is a very simple derivation that perhaps your physics professors would cringe at, if not laugh. Uh, but it's kind of like to illustrate why we arrived at this expression which we are going to be using later on in other uh, scenarios, all right? So notice, for example, that if we say that two samples of gas have the same kinetic energy, right? That's what we said. We said that according to the, let me go back to our, uh, let me give you a chance to keep uh, finish writing that, and then I'll go back to the slideshow so we can see what I mean, all right? Again, remember that we are going to be using a statistical approach to figuring out what the speeds of molecules is, are, I'm sorry. So what the kinetic molecular theory said is that at any two gases at the same temperature have the same average kinetic energy. And what we just derived was an expression that says that the average kinetic energy is one half times the mass times the mean square speed. In other words, the statistical average of the square of the speeds of these particles. Now realize, if I'm saying that two gases that are different, in other words, let's say carbon dioxide and let's say uh, helium, at the same temperature, we're going to say they have the same average kinetic energy. Think about it. Since they're different molecules, they have different masses. So if one of them has a bigger mass than the other one, what does that mean about their speed then? It's lower. Exactly. They're inversely related. If I increase this number here, the other one has to decrease to keep this number constant. So in other words, if a gas has bigger molecules, it's also going to have to have lower average speeds. See what I'm saying? Okay? So keep that in mind because that comes from simply looking at this from a math perspective. Again, ratios and proportions. In this case, to keep the energy the same, two gases will have to compensate for the differences in masses by also compensating with different velocities in there, okay? So that's what the uh, kinetic molecular theory says, okay? Any questions about the theory overall?
We're good? So let's go and now explain the behavior of gases that we observe using this theory. First of all, we said that gases are the most compressible uh, state, physical state. Now imagine, why are you able to easily compress a sample of gas? Because essentially there's a lot of room between the molecules. There's a lot of space between the particles, and so there's plenty of room for you to put them closer together, and they really don't budge, they don't, they don't care. As opposed to a liquid or solid where the particles are very clumped together, there's not a lot of room in between to compress it. Okay, everybody see that? Cool? Okay, let's explain Boyle's Law. All right, let's explain Boyle's Law. Uh, consider the following. If the pressure of a gas is related to the rate at which the particles collide with the walls of the container. So let me use this analogy here. I'm going to put a pair of books here, all right? And I'm going to pretend that these books are, let me put it this way so you don't know what it is. I don't want to give free advertising to the publishers here, okay? So let's pretend these are the walls of the uh, container, all right? And I have, let's say, a single molecule of gas, and it's kind of bouncing in between them, right? Let's say that I now make the container bigger, right? Notice that I'm going essentially about one collision per second on each wall. Let's say that I now make this a little bigger and the ball's moving at the same speed. Notice that it takes it longer to go from one side to the other one, assuming its speed hasn't changed, right? We haven't changed the temperature. Remember, Boyle's law is at constant temperature. So what that means is that it's going to take longer for each particle to reach the other side before it collides again. If you multiply that times all the particles in the sample, what's going to happen is you have less collisions per time, right? You have a lower frequency of collisions, right? So if you decrease the volume now, I'm going to put them together and I look closer together. And now again, I'm going to have these guys bouncing at the same speed, right? What's going to happen now is that it's a shorter distance and therefore you're going to have more collisions per second because it has less distance to travel. Everybody see that? So the idea then is that because now the molecules have less room, less space to travel before they hit the wall of the container, what you have is you have more collisions per unit time and therefore you have a higher pressure, which is what Boyle's Law says. You know, decrease the volume, increase the pressure. Increase the volume, decrease the pressure. Okay? Let's look at Charles's Law that says that the volume increases with an increase in temperature. Okay, so let me go back here, put my container walls in here. Again, bring my molecule of gas, and let's say that it's coming back and forth, you know, about one collision per second. And now let's say I increase the temperature, which means now my molecule of gas has more kinetic energy, so it moves faster. More collisions means higher what? Higher pressure, right? Higher pressure, which means that now the pressure inside is building up and it's causing these guys to get pushed until the pressure inside decreases enough to where it's the same as the pressure on the outside and it no longer uh, can push the container out. But in the process, what has happened is that the what has happened is that the volume has increased. See that? So again, by invoking this idea that the kinetic energy of the particles depends on the temperature, increasing temperature means you're increasing the average kinetic energy. More energy means they're moving faster and therefore they're increasing the number of collisions with the wall of the container. And as a result, what's gonna happen is since the pressure on the outside stayed constant, the pressure on the inside increased, it pushes out 
and it causes a, a, a expansion of the gas, or in other words, it increases the volume. Let me pull these down so you can, can see the bottom of the screen here. All right. So you can see how the uh, kinetic molecular theory explains these laws that we observe in the macro world by looking at the properties of the actual molecules or particles of the gas. All right. Uh, the other law that we studied was Avogadro's law. That one said that if you increase the number of particles, you're going to have an increase in the volume. So let's see how that would work. Let me bring back my little sample uh, container here. Again, I'm going to put it at a small volume. And again, I have my particle of gas that's kind of like bouncing back and forth. But now let's say there's two of them. All right. So whereas before I had to wait for this particle to hit one side and then come back, now I have another one already hitting that side. So basically what I've done is I've increased the number of collisions. If I increase the number of collisions, that means that I'm increasing the pressure inside. So I'm going to end up pushing out the container until they're back to where they hit the walls of the container, kind of the way it happened when there was only one of them. And now at this point, the pressure inside is equalized with the pressure on the outside. And so the container stays at that volume. But notice that now the container has expanded, right? The gas has expanded. So essentially, more particles means more collisions against the container. Since the outside pressure has remained constant, that means that the collisions cause the gas to push against the container until the pressure equilibrates. The result is that the gas has had a net increase in its volume. In other words, it has expanded. So you can see how Boyle's law, Charles's law, Avogadro's law, all can be explained by this simple model of the kinetic molecular theory. The other law that we studied was uh, Dalton's law of partial pressures, which said that if you have a mixture of gases, essentially the total pressure in the container is the sum of the partial pressure of each gas. In other words, each gas generates a partial pressure that depends on the number of moles of that particular gas in there. But why is that? Well, we can explain it because we say that those molecules do not repel or attract each other. In other words, the pressure exerted by one type of molecule of gas is totally unaffected by the presence of other gas molecules. Every gas in that sample behaves as if the other gases weren't even there. And so essentially, the pressure that that gas generates only depends on how many molecules that gas are in there, right? The other gases do the same. So in other words, the total pressure is the sum of the partial pressures of all the gases. That's a very interesting, uh, simple theory. I think it's, it's elegant in its simplicity. I know that I walked you some math calculations that seemed, you know, a little out there. But honestly, if you look back at them later, you'll realize, no, these are simple calculations. Like I said, if I took that to a physics professor, they'd probably laugh in my face. Uh, that's so simple. But I just wanted to illustrate you where that expression came of the kinetic energy. Now, of course, at this point, all we know about kinetic energy is, A, that it has to do with motion of particles. B, that it is uh, a measure of work that is done. In other words, that's what it takes to move a particle from this point to that point uh, and so forth. In the next chapter, we'll study uh, kinetic energy in more detail and uh, we will see the interaction between temperature and kinetic energy, all right? Okay, any questions before we take our break? Any questions so far? Cool. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll reconvene at five till two and then we're gonna look at one way of measuring these molecular speeds and energies of particles, right? Let's take a 10 minute break.